on today's story beat. What I said to myself with every set of notes that felt contradictory from the previous notes, I said to myself, this could be a movie. There might be a day you're on the set of this movie. So you need to function as someone who's going to get a movie made, which means lifetimes funding this, these notes are going to get a movie made. And coming from that perspective made it easier for me to be flexible, to be a team player, because I kept picturing the film being made. And I was lucky that I, that that's what happened. Well, that, um, that, that's a great attitude. Yes, and it, you know what? Attitude is everything. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, the writer Shannon Bradley Colleri, wrote the screenplay for the film To the Stars, which screened in the U.S. Dramatic Features category at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival. Kim Yutani, the festival's director of programming, said, To the Stars tells a timeless, beautiful story of young women at a critical point in their lives. The film was released by Samuel Goldwyn in 2020, and the book adaptation, also written by Shannon, was released in June 2021. Shannon has published four other books, too, including Into the Child, 40 Weeks in the Gestational Wilderness, Smash, Crash, and Burn, Tales from the Edge of Celebrity, Married Sex, Fact and Fiction, and She Dated the Asshats, But Married the Good Guy, How to Go from Toxic Love to Real Love in 12 Exercises. Shannon also wrote the screenplay for the upcoming Lifetime movie, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, the Richard and Christine Carlson story. She authors a popular blog called The Woman, formerly known as Beautiful, which has been featured in Oprah Magazine, The Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, The Today Show, HuffPo Live, NPR, CNN, and more. Beyond all that, Shannon happens to be married to one of my favorite story beat guests, the extraordinary screenwriter and producer, Michael Colary. So for all those reasons and many more, it's a great pleasure for me to have the brilliant writer, Shannon Bradley Colary, join me on story beat today. Shannon, welcome to the show. Thank you. I, I feel so special hearing all those things. I'm like, wait a minute. That's well, awesome. Well, you're thank special you. and I'm special because I have you on my show. Oh, thanks so much. So let's go all the way back in time. Where, what were your earliest inspirations? What got you to think about, hey, I would like to be in the arts. I'd like to be a writer. I'd like to be in show business. Where did that begin? Well, it began after I graduated from USC with a broadcast journalism degree, and I spent four months working in a small market in Palm Desert in 120 degree heat, <laughs> sitting on, you know, uh, I remember it was during the Jim Baker, Tammy Faye Baker scandal. Uh, Jim had pulled some shenanigans with women and I think money issues, and uh, me and my poor cameraman would sit on a wall outside their home in 120 degree heat, <laughs> trying to get a glimpse of them, you know, but mostly it was the dead bodies. Uh, after about three dead bodies, I thought, ah, this isn't what I signed up for. I think I should be an actress because that makes sense. I've never acted before. So it ma makes perfect sense <laughs> that I would now go to Hollywood and pursue acting. And um, the great I had the great fortune of studying with the late Jeff Corey, who was mm. a really beloved uh, not just actor, but, um, you know, uh, acting coach. Oh yeah. Very, yeah. very well known and highly respected. Oh, I loved him. He sort of became a father figure for me. Um, and, uh, you know, he got into teaching acting during the, um, you know, the boycott or what was that called? Where the, where it was during the McCarthy era, all the band, uh, during the writers, black, the blacklist, the blacklist, period. exactly. And so he was an actor who was banned for many years from performing. And so he, to survive, started an acting uh, teaching workshop. And I mean, he taught everyone from James Dean to Jane Fonda. I mean, his list was amazing. But his 
uh, advice to me was to read five plays a week if I wanted to be a serious actor. And it was reading hundreds of plays over the course of years that I studied with him where I began writing my own monologues for auditions. And then pretty soon these monologues evolved into one act plays, which were just by sheer luck, somebody saw me perform one of my monologues at a festival and asked if it was from anything. And so uh, midway in my attempt to be a working actor, which meant waiting a lot of tables, slinging a lot of hash, um, I had three, three one act plays produced over the course of a couple of years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And in that time, um, you know, my producers on the last show laughed when I told them they premiered in Burbank because <laughs> I, you know, it sounds like, oh, I was a Broadway, you know, playwright. No, no, I was a Burbank playwright. Um, <laughs> But it was exciting, and I didn't want to act in any of the you, plays. You were, most importantly, a produced playwright. Thank you. I, you know what? I'm going to call them and tell them because they laugh all the time about Magnolia Boulevard being my venue. But, um, you know, right? I, I was told I could perform in the plays if I wanted to, and I realized I didn't want to. I wanted to see them. I wanted to be in the audience and be able to see them and sort of workshop them. And so you, you became you became a writer in a, a kind of a circuitous way where you yes. weren't intending to be a writer. It wasn't something exactly. that fascinated you as a child. This right. was something you did almost out of necessity because yeah. you wanted to be something else, an actor. Yeah. Or, and I wanted to be able to, well, here's the funny thing. I'd written my whole life, you know, creatively as a kid, as short stories and things like that. And I was given a lot of, you know, kudos from teachers and mentors. And I was terrified to become a professional writer. I loved writing and I didn't want to learn to hate it. What, what the terror for you was that you thought that you I would, would learn to hate writing. I that, see. that if I didn't want to put my financial well being on something that I loved, it, I liken it to joining the swim team in high school. And I'd always been an ocean swimmer, and you know, doing it competitively made me hate it. And I thought, I don't want that to happen with my writing. So I ended up sort of being sucked back into it, you know, as an actor, it's just, you know, that whole arena, the filmmaking arena, whether it's writing or directing or, or acting or performing it, it all comes from the same, I think, place in the brain and in the heart. Oh, it does. And that's why, you know, and that's why so many wonderful actors and writers end up becoming remarkable painters. And, you know, it's just that, that whole creative process. And well, I think one of the things that took me a long time to, to understand was that uh, when you're writing a screenplay in particular, you are sort of, I think of as one leg of a triangle that's all pulling toward the same center. Yeah. And so you, the, the director, the actors and the writer are, and then all of the technicians around that are yeah. all pulling toward creating this one thing called this story. Yes. And, and you're all part and parcel in it. There's no real difference between what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. It's just, it's just your approach is different. Yeah. And one of my favorite playwrights was John Patrick Shanley. Mm. Uh, I used to um, perform a lot of his monologues from Danny in the Deep Blue Sea and um, Savage in Limbo and Women of Manhattan. And from him, uh, that he stimulated me as a writer in, in ways that, and not just that, but a lot of his prefaces in his plays talk about what it means to be creative and how to interface as a creative person with the commercial world and how unwieldy and uncomfortable that can be. And he, he actually gives quite a lot of advice about how to, how to navigate that process. And so, yeah, I mean, um, so those years were impoverished, but second years well, for me. <laughs> well, well, you, yeah. you and a million other writers are yeah. go through the, yeah. the lean years, including me, that's for sure. Uh, so, so how did you, once you decided this is something you wanted to do, did you go get training anywhere? What I did was um, I, my, uh, I, I decided when the plays were produced that the only way to make a living would be to write some screenplays. And I was at the age of 30, you know, I came to the end of seven years trying to act and I did get a lot of work, but never enough to where I could live off of it. So I thought I need to make this transition and I applied to the UCLA MFA I remember feeling really old, like I'm just too old at 30, you know, to go back to school. Now at 56, I'm like, you baby, like, of course you needed to go back to school. So I did, I got, and I was fortunate to get into the MFA when I was there for a couple of years. I, um, you, you weren't that old. I went to, I went to school there when I was in my fifties. 
Well, okay. So it's never too late. It's never too, no, it really isn't. If anyone is listening, you know, look at Jane Fonda. Her third act is probably more productive than any other act in her life. As they say at UCLA, the only people who don't succeed coming out of that program are those that don't do it, that give up. Yes, exactly. So you have to, you have to do it, whether you're young, old, or in between, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and and there and and I think there's this sort of myth that there's a lot of ageism in this business, and I mean I'm assuming as in terms of certain acting roles and things like that that could be true, and and of course getting on staff in a young show with a lot of young writers might be difficult, but as long as you're producing incredible content, it doesn't matter how old you are, in my opinion. In I agree. Case. Yeah, I, I agree. The, so, there there is there is that weird distinctive thing that happens mainly only in Hollywood, which is that uh, they tend on certain disciplines, sitcoms in particular, there's a tendency to hew toward young writers. Right. But I think that the even mature writers can succeed in Hollywood uh, if they apply themselves in the right way. Absolutely. And I do think some of those barriers are being broken. Like granted, Marta Kaufman wrote Friends and that's why she can write Grace and Frankie. I mean, mm-hmm. but, the, but the really exciting thing about that show in particular, even if it's uneven creatively, you know, but the thing that's great about that is um, it's a hit. You know, it's a huge hit. And I think that's a good thing for executives to see, which is there's an audience out there that has money that is wants to see these stories and see themselves represented. And so it's very encouraging in my opinion. So, okay. So now you're, you've decided to start writing and you're writing. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you think to yourself, you were good at it right away? Or did it take you a while to think to yourself, Hey, you know what? I am pretty decent at this. Well, what's funny is the, one of the plays that was produced called the lion sleeps tonight, I wrote in the MFA and the teacher I had at the time who I won't name was very negative about it. So I took the play that was 30 pages and I put water on it and grew it to 95 pages. And right. the teacher at the time said, look, no one's going to, be- it was a romantic con- comedy. He says, no one's going to believe these characters fall in love. There's no hook. There's no log line. And I thought, you know, I sat in an audience and I heard a lot of people laughing. So I did have a kind of confidence that maybe a new writer would not have in the material. And I remember thinking, you know, this professor is really not suitable for young new writers if he's going to be this dampening, you know. And at that time at UCLA, they had something called Specs Appeal. I don't know if they still have it, but it is was an event where five screenplays would be chosen to be put on stage, you'd pick one scene from your screenplay and the entire industry would come. Wow. So the script that he incurred discouraged me from writing, I wrote anyway, because it had been produced. It went, it won and got it Specs Appeal Award and I was able to stage one scene from the screenplay. Uh, I was then pursued by Paradigm and William Morris I chose William Morris and we sold it to Warner Brothers for six figures. And and you can imagine my yeah, you can imagine my delight to tell the teacher what happened. And (laughs) and so, you know, I had beginner's luck. So I think I was a little cocky. I think I was maybe overconfident. Did did it did it cause you problems where you thought you you would you could do no harm or or you know, could you couldn't lose? Did you go off that way? No, I think what happened to me, and I think this happens to a lot of writers, and I think UCLA has adjusted, is that it's one thing to sell a script. It's another thing to go into development. I was very young and immature as a professional writer, and I was overly protective of the product and the words. I I did not have, um, I, I was not yet prolific in my writing. And so I had a huge, and that's one of the pieces of advice I would give any new writer is you know don't die upon your sword for any one piece of writing because you know filmmaking is a collaborative medium and i've been in the career once early on and and i quit for eight years and have just recently come back Mm -hmm. and i'm starting to be successful now as someone who gets things produced so anyway it was a struggle it was like i sold it thought i was the cock of the walk and then I had to go into development, and that was very challenging. I, I teach my students early on that uh, one of the things you have to develop if you're going to succeed in a place like Los Angeles in Hollywood is 
is a, a shell. You have to be willing to work with people and you have to certainly be willing to accept their feedback, whatever that is, yes. positive and negative. Yes. And I think the other thing too is, um, you know, I'm, I've been working for the last three years. I started, I stopped screenwriting in 2008 when the Writers Guild strike happened. And I restarted in 2018 when a film of mine went into production just mm. without, I don't even know how it happened, honestly. We can get into that later, but um, this ten, time ten, around- 10 years later. Oh yeah, 10 wow. years later. And wow. this time around, um, I am so collaborative. You know, I'm this Lifetime movie that is gonna be airing on October 16th, I must have done 20 rewrites because the needs of the network kept changing in terms of the topicality of the script. And I could have probably gone to the Writers Guild and forced them to pay me more money. And I could have made a big stink about the process. And I just was like, what is in my best interest? Getting a film made, sure. being a team player. Do I want to work for them again? I do. So let's get this made. And, and, and it was shot you know, last month and Heather, Heather Locklear came out of retirement, you know, to shoot it. And I, so for me, that was this time around, I just have such a more flexible, open, uh, collaborative point of view. About I, I would, I would call that maturity. Yeah. Yeah. It's that you accepted the fact that it is a collaborative business that Absolutely. that your work actually isn't that precious that yes. your work is a blueprint and not a final product yes. which is different from writing a novel obviously yes. we'll talk yes. about that i think right now we'll start to talk about that a little bit yes. do you think of yourself I, I know you think of yourself as a writer but do you think of yourself as a writer of certain disciplines or yes. just in general you're a writer well, you know, I quit the business in, business in 2008. I worked a lot, made good money, and nothing got produced. And my um, agent quit the business, and I just couldn't get another agent. I was mm -hmm. just DOA. So I thought, you know, I'm going to start a blog. I, I, I And what was great about the blog, I wrote over probably 600 posts in 10, 10 years. Um, made no money, by the way. I mean, I made some money. I broke even, probably. But um, what was so great about that, that? That, by the way, is better than most. Well, maybe, yeah. Um, what was great about doing that was the automatic feedback I had, and it was all positive. And you don't get that as a screenwriter because oh, no. if you're not produced, you just don't get it. And it oh, no. years before, right? So getting this automatic feedback, and the hilarious thing is, um, I'd get a lot of trolls, people telling me that I was as shallow as a contact lens, and you know, <laughs> just just all kinds of mean stuff. Like I did this whole body image thing, and I ended up on to the day, today show for that. And it ended up on the daily mail and, oh, she's a cow and she's a this and she's a that, you know? Uh -huh. And it just was like, but what was so great about it was that I wrote so many words, so many things that it just was exercising that muscle. You know, it was just like writing is writing. It doesn't matter in what context. I it agree. All, it all, it just improves your writing. And novel is a different, you know, approach. Uh, Nonfiction is a different approach. Screenplays are a different approach, but it's all writing and it, it, all, it is. all adds up. And the more writing you do, the, the more powerful you get as a writer. Yes. And so I when think. I came back to writing, I had all these kudos from the blogging world. Like I, I, I was lucky. I got, I won quite a few awards and I got to like, you know, I actually got to perform some of my blogs in front of like an audiences at conferences and Queen Latifah introducing me. I mean, it, it was really cool. I had one of my blog posts was blown up into like a life-size poster that I got to stand in front of. I mean, it was kind of fun. So even though there was very little money to be made, um, it was worth its weight in gold, ultimately. I, and I, again, yeah, just doing it just kept you doing it. And that's mm -hmm. more important than anything else. It's like, yeah. you don't, you don't become a great athlete by sitting on a chair. No, you gotta you, work. You gotta work, and there, and and it is hard work. There's no question about it. So tell tell us a bit about uh, to the stars. What's the yeah. story? What is that all about? Well, this is kind of I I wrote it while I was at UCLA. So um, it went into production in 2018. So it was a 20 year old script. And for any Whew, wow. writers, yeah, I I went on the blacklist which is a platform for writers to be able to put their work up and have industry people um, 
you know, review it mm -hmm. and download it. And so in 2018, when I was like, okay, the blog is kind of winding down, I get a phone call from these young producers saying they picked it up off the blacklist and can they shop it around? Or that might've been 2016. I said, sure, why not? So for two years, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then in 2018, they attracted Martha Stevens, who's a beautiful director. Um, her previous film, which was called Land Ho, had gone to Sundance in the world category and had sold, I mean, I think they made it for 200,000. It sold for 1.8 million and kind of was a big deal. And, and they approached me about her potentially directing it and they were trying to attach, uh, get money for it. And they were able to uh, attach really amazing talent. Isla Fisher actually said yes to it. And then funnily enough, right before we started shooting, she dropped out. Hmm. She was the person who got the, who actually was the reason we got funding. Yeah, right? she, she was what dragged the money in. She dragged the money in and then she disappeared at a certain point. But we had like Malin Ackerman, Tony Hale, Shea Wiggum, I mean, amazing character actors and mainstream actors and Jordana Spiro from Ozark. And, and so in 2018, I remember, I kind of forget your original question, but what happened is when well, that the, one, the question is, what's the story about? What is it? What is yeah, it? Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'm sorry. So here's the story. The story is um, about Iris Dearborn. She is this teenage girl living in Waukini, Kansas in 1971. And she's the untouchable of Waukini. She's the scapegoat for everybody. She's mm. got this anxiety disorder. Her mother's an alcoholic. Her father's a very stoic farmer. The mother is abusive, emotionally abusive, um, um, just always kind of degrading Iris. And so she just has the smell of a victim. And, and when you've got that, you know, you just don't have any you don't have any, there's nothing that's safe. And right. so the feeling of this town, Waukini, Kansas, 1961, is these wide open skies have a very suffocating, insular, contained, you know, percolating kind of hellscape. And into this comes Maggie Richmond, who's this gorgeous, whip smart new girl from the big city. And she's the new penny that everybody wants to put in their pocket, but she's just, inevitably drawn to Iris. And we don't really understand why until it's revealed that Maggie has a dark, shameful secret that sort of unspools in the dangerous ways. And mm. so this is a transformative friendship for Iris and for Maggie. Um, but in the end, uh, kind of all hell breaks loose. And, um, you know, in 2012, uh, when, when it was on the blacklist, um, it got really well reviewed and I was someone from what William Morris reached out and Emma Watson was interested in actually being Maggie. Wow. Yeah. It was a big deal. And that was almost brought me out of retirement. You know, I never got to meet Emma, but I actually met a lot of the directors that were interested in doing it. But the, the only reason it fell apart was that Emma wanted a huge filmmaker. She wanted like a Baz Luhrmann or an Alfonso Cuaron or someone like that. And, None of them were interested in doing a small, it's a small, tiny little movie, you know, so that died and went away. And, but this, this film, this little screenplay got me a lot of work. That writing sample probably made me a half million dollars. Wow. Just as a writer. I just kept getting hired off of it. So by miraculously in 2018, it went into production in Oklahoma and um, was shot in black and white in color. Martha really wanted it to only be in black and white, but the financiers were like, we have to hedge our bets on this. Black and white's a little difficult. So when it was accepted as a Sundance film, it, it premiered there in black and white. Um, it, we, I, we went everywhere. I mean, I was fortunate. I got to go to Arkansas to the Bentonville Festival. I got to go to, um, you know, Carlo Viveri in the Czech Republic for the international premiere. and. Um, you know, in Europe, they, they think the writer's really important. So people were asking for my oh, autograph, oh, not here in, in America. Oh, know. those European the fools. Europeans they, were so wonderful to me. They, thinking they the actually, writer like, is important. Yeah, the writer's important there. I mean, I took my teenage daughters and they couldn't <laughs> believe it when people were asking for my autograph. They were like, what the hell is going on here? Like <laughs> rolling their eyes. And yeah, it was funny. For, for those listeners that may not understand what we're talking about, when you're in Hollywood and you're a writer, you're not generally thought of with too much respect. And yet 
You have no. nothing without the writers. You're le- you have zero yeah. without the writers, but the writers are not well thought of yeah, or highly yeah. regarded. No. But elsewhere they say, in the world, they say they having are. a well, they say having a writer on a set is like asking a hooker to stay for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I always love that. But you I'm, know, that's I'm, really in the feature world. If you're a TV creator and producer, you have a lot more. You're, if you're well, Shonda Rhimes, you have a lot of respect. Well, it's a whole different thing in TV. <laughs> yeah, TV, the, the writer different. is the power. Yes. Yes. In in movies, the director is the power, or mm-hmm. it could be a producer who's the power, but usually it's the director. Uh, um, but in TV, the, the writers are the executive producers; yeah. they're the people That's that right. call the shots. So it's a totally different story. But yeah. through even those people throughout the whole of Hollywood are not well regarded or highly thought of. So, that, but but elsewhere, people understand yeah. and respect writing as something. Yeah. So, all right, so I'm I'm curious. You also then was it your idea to adapt it into a novel? Well, the thing is, I thought it would never get made. So I'd already started the adaptation process before 2018. Were I you thought hoping they- to? Were you hoping to write the novel that would then help push it into being produced? No, I, I actually, you know, I had given up screenwriting. I had just given it up. I just thought, you know, this is too hard. I failed. Um, yeah, I made a living, but it, nothing ever came of it. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm going to write novels now and books and and try to get a, you know, publisher and try and make that world happen for me. And so I already put a good year of work into the adaptation. Um, it was the first time I'd written a piece of fiction. My other books had been mem- memoirs for the most part or self-help books. Right. Um, so cold from my blog, you M- know. More nonfiction. This is yeah, fiction. Yeah, this was fiction. So um, I just didn't want the story to end with I'd be on a shelf somewhere. So I, I that's how I'd start. So when the film started to be produced, I negotiated novel rights to make sure that I was able to finish it as a novel also, since I'd already put so much time into it. That's how that happened. All right. So let's talk about the challenges of that. How, what was the, what were the bigger challenges for you coming to it as the person that created the underlying story, the, the screenplay, which is the, the, where you started, what were the challenges of then translating that into a novel, which is has many similarities, but has serious differences. Well, and this is what I'd say to anyone listening who is interested in, not in being a, a, a novel writer or uh, writing fiction. Um, again, I had to learn to be collaborative. That mm-hmm. fiction writing was not a medium I'd ever approached. Um, I have a friend named Diane Sear who ended up editing the book for me. And I remember I sent, she's edited my other books. Um, she's fantastic. And I went to her with my draft thinking, you know, she'll just start editing it for me and it'll, but it'll be mine. And she, you know, she's just going to fix typos and blah, blah, blah. She called me and she goes, this is not ready for me. And I'm like, what do you mean? She says, this is not a novel. This is not what a novel should be like there. I can't see anything. I can't imagine anything. Yes. I, I, the narrator's and boy, was that shocking. Was that because I, when you write a screenplay, you leave a lot of that stuff yes, out? Yes, that stuff, the actor and the director and the, and the set designer, and those are things they create. Mm-hmm. So again, it was a humbling experience traveling, you know, trying to make the transition from screenwriting to fiction writing. I again- You have to, you have to fill in all the blanks of that world, yes, don't you? all of it. It's just a completely different animal. And I had to admit to myself, look, you're a novice at this. This is a new- form and I, I had to be a student again and my editor became my became my teacher hmm. and for over a year we went back and forth and back and forth and I almost stopped at a certain point I'm like look I don't even know if novels and books are very difficult to earn from and I really am in this place now of wanting to earn and 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 what the film getting the film produced did was it got me to write another screenplay which I sold to Warner Brothers so I started getting earning again and so I almost abandoned the novel, but I just couldn't because I thought, you know what? I put so much elbow grease into this that mm-hmm. I just have to follow through. Um, but I had to open up again to learning this new this new uh, form. Did you use the screenplay as an outline for the book? Mm-hmm. So you didn't yeah. need to you didn't need to go back to ground zero and create no. a new outline. You mm-hmm. had the story worked out. Yeah. So, so well, now it was a matter of padding it out in some way or to, to fleshing yeah. it out. And there was one other thing that ha- happened. Um, so in the no- in the screenplay and in the film, uh, the girls always, the you know Maggie and Iris first interact at this pond in the evening, Sumner Pond. Who be- Sumner Pond becomes sort of a character in its own right. 
Um, and there's, it's no one goes there because this crackpot, you know, mentally ill woman, Charlotte Owings drowned herself there and they never found the body because there's all these caves and aquifers and it's just creepy. So it becomes um, this safe place for these two girls who have secrets and especially Iris, who's the town scapegoat. That's her safe place. That's her, you know, and suddenly in the novel, Charlotte Owings, the dead woman who committed suicide became the narrator and that is not in the film and so that completely shifted the novel into becoming its own creature did, and did, it, did it change the tone to, to, it changed everything changed everything. And in a way that was it didn't change the story the plot the plot's still the same but it changed the tone it changed the humor it changed the yeah so it's its own it's its own and, that's and a, novels and, its own thing and wouldn't you agree that that is really a common thing for novels being translated to screenplays and vice versa yes. that the tone shifts and somehow you have to find different things to make each different medium work you know what's funny is um martha stevens who directed to the stars approached me to do an adaptation of a ya novel called 99 days it's a new york times bestseller it's a ya novel um, Martha didn't want to write it on her own. She, uh, Alloy Entertainment's interested in her directing it. And so Martha came to me and said, would you be willing to co-write this with me? <clears throat> so it was the first novel adaptation I'd ever done. And with a, with a partner, especially. Um, we had so much fun and it totally became tonally a different animal. Mm -hmm. we, we, we had to we had to make the character interesting for us as writers and specifically for Martha as a filmmaker. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's fun to move into these new experiences that you've never had, ex you know, you, you've got a set of tools as a writer. Um, now I've been writing in some form since I was 27, so right. 30, almost 30 years. Um, so you have a certain amount of confidence, but moving into these new areas, you want to become humble again. You want to become a learner. You want to become open and flexible and, you know, be willing to say, ask for help and get other people's opinions. And I don't know, for me, it's, it's, I feel like I'm a kid again. You know, it's weird. It's kind of I fun. For, I, for one, hope that um, you never stop learning. I think the day that you mm -hmm. stop learning, you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and that growth keeps you hopefully young and fresh. Yeah. Um, and, and there are plenty of people out there in whatever discipline they're in that they say, well, I know everything I need to know and I'm not going to learn anymore. And, well, and their career is more or less over at that point. Well, here's the funny thing too. I decided to write a war movie. I did a shit ton of research. My agents didn't like it. It's sitting in my computer. I wrote a horror film because I felt like I want to do that. Um, they like that. There's a director who's really interested in it. And I've done a ton of drafts on it. And he wants a rewrite. So, you know, both those things, I don't regret writing the war film. It may be that I'll repurpose it and it might be something that will come to some sort of home eventually. The horror movie, I'm like, I love this director. Actually, he just directed something called Till Death with Megan Fox and it's like blowing up on Netflix. It's got 88% Rotten Tomatoes. I'm like, I get to work with a super talented young director mm -hmm. and I am going to work with him on the script. I'll be the only writer, but I'm going to write the script that he wants to direct. So he has now become the goal. So the screenplay, I don't need to be protective of it. I need to be to shepherd it to a place where a very talented director is willing to spend a year of his life on it. Mm -hmm. And that a bunch of people are going to want to invest their millions of dollars in making it. You know, I, it was so funny. I got to be on the Nashville set last this like two weeks ago to see the lifetime movie being shot right and of course i show up for the night shoots i did not plan my timing well and it was the storm and the mudslide oh boy so there's like water trucks there there's two cranes with lightning and moonlight and heather and her, the two other actors are being drenched and leaf blowers in their face <laughs> all this stuff and i'm the writer right and i'm i'm wanting to hide i'm like everyone's miserable and it's my fault but I just felt this <laughs> gratitude. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful. Were they actually miserable or were they having fun? I think they had fun. 
I think you know, I had fun too. Because it's, it's make believe. It's make believe. <laughs> it is. But I mean, you know, a leaf blower in your face. I guess my point is, I'm now very humble about all of it. I'm like, I am so lucky if anyone wants to put money into one of these things and risk their, you know, do the financing and risk take a risk or well, well it's one of the great maxims of screenwriting that you know i can write in you can write in one line uh, yeah. the largest armada in the history of the world rises over the horizon yeah. and that's now going to cost somebody 15 million dollars to exactly. produce exactly and you don't think of it until you're on a set and you're like oh my god this is expensive oh boy <laughs> people are people are actually drenched and <laughs> mud having mud coming over their head and yeah, yeah you know and i just wrote it in my kitchen <laughs> and you know that was yeah. easy for and, me and it was I really was eating, i was eating a muffin you, exactly you typed it out in 20 seconds and there it was and, and somebody has to then translate it into the reality of making movie out yeah, of it yeah, yeah, uh, yeah all right so so uh, our, talk about rewriting how important is rewriting i mean that's everything i know you everyone says that mm -hmm. right I, everybody who's a seasoned writer says right rewriting is writing it's everything and so one thing i've learned is you know the brain is an onion and there are many different layers and the first layer of your writing is 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 your id i guess it's not your super ego or your frontal cortex or whatever and the more you come back to the work, especially if you can give yourself time away from it, like this horror film I wrote a year ago. Right. And um, haven't read it really since the last rewrite I did for some of the producers that picked it up. They picked it up, up six months ago. So were I hadn't you, read it. Were you happy with it when you finished it? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was great. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah, it's ready. It's ready. You should just shoot this. And then for six months, the producers gave me shit ton of notes. Of course. And I did them and I did them and I did them because I have a better attitude this time around. I'm like, and by the way, I'm not getting paid yet at all. I did not sell this. This right. is not, I mean, I don't even know if I believe in spec sales anymore. I believe in trying to get a film made. The, the, and, the whole the whole industry has changed on that so dramatically yeah, over yeah. the last I 20 mean, years. It's like, I want to get paid, but and i will get paid if it gets made right so i'll get paid somewhere in that process but every spec script i've ever sold has never been made because invariably they don't have talent attached they don't have means of sort of and so you end up in this in this development situation with people that are not necessarily creatives they're executives you know that's their job some of them are smart i mean i i mean a lot of them are smart but it's a complicated process. So yes, rewriting is everything and working with people on the work is important. It, it you sure, are it serving sure is. a client. You, are, you have a client, you have to think of it that way. And if you are asking a director to spend a year of his or her life shooting it, going into pre-production, filming it, post-production, everything, they have to love it. They have to love it. In fact, the script that I wrote with Martha she has to direct it. it's the first time i had a co-screenwriter i would write pages and she would be somewhat excited by them and finally i said look let me lay down the tracks because i feel like i'm pretty good with structure and then you have to rewrite every single page you have to make sure it's the dialogue you love it's the the setting is the way you want to see it because you're going to be doing this for a year of your life mm -hmm. and I'm going to be moving on to other projects. Right. Well, that's, that's so, a really great attitude. Um, yeah. And she's a good writer. So, so I would get pages back and be really happy with what she did. I mean, she, she, she's not, not a writer. She's not just a director, but yeah. I mean, every situation is different. If you sell a spec, you got to work with the executives. You so, have so when you're creating a screenplay, when you're creating a novel, whatever those things are that you're creating that are going to be time, labor, and money intensive, yeah. what would you say are the things that writers should think about in terms of securing a sale? What do you, what do you think about, I need to do this and I need to not do that? What are those things? Well, if you're trying to um, <clears throat> sell a script on spec, and when I was coming up in the late '90s, early 2000s, we, we, we should we should be insane. we should be clear for the for the listeners that don't know. When you say on spec, it's speculation. You're writing it in the hope of selling it. That's what on spec means. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and you should write a lot of things on spec. You should have you should have um, you know uh, 
you should be proactive in that way. Um, so long story short, if you're trying to sell something in the spec market, which was huge in the late 90s, early 2000s, it's much contracted now. I think the business models changed drastically, totally. but, you still, but you can still sell things on spec. I did in 2018. But, but um, the spec market is tiny at this point. Yeah, it's small. It's hard to hard to do do it that way. There's a lot of ways to skin a cat. So anyway, um, I think there are a lot of things to think about when you're going to try and sell something. Number one, you have, it has to be flawless. So what that means is you write your spec and then you get notes and you get notes and you rewrite and you rewrite and you rewrite and you make sure that you are putting your best foot forward because the spec may not even sell but you might get an agent from it. Mm -hmm. You might get a producer that loves it. You might get more opportunities because, because of it, like I did with uh, To The Stars. I mean, I got a lot of jobs just from that writing sample because it was really, really well done. In, in, the, so, in the marketing world, it can become what's known as a loss leader. What does that mean? So, so you sometimes you produce things that you're losing money on, but it yeah. leads people to other things that make you money. Yeah. So it's a yeah. lost leader. It, yeah. it, it's, it's what it's out front. You're showing it to people and they're saying, Hey, we really like you don't want this script, but what else you got? Or we want to hire you for something. Yes. And another thing I would say, if you're heading into the feature market, again, feature films have become very contracted in terms of the business model. People, you know, it's sort of like you've got your indie films and then you've got the Marvel universe, mm -hmm. right? Like yep. it, it, it's very hard. That's a smaller market than it used to be. I, I'm actually trying to transition into television now. Um, and because of my age, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm going to be some, I've never worked on a show. So I'm, you know, they're looking at an older person. They're like, and she, does she have the stamina, you know, cause it's hard. So I'm creating, hard. I'm creating my own original series because I'm like, that's how I put myself first. Um, but but, you're, but you're in a position now where creating your own series, you'll be taken seriously. If you're yeah, starting yeah. out and you've yeah. never gotten anything produced, it's very hard to be taken seriously. Yeah, it's you got to find the right champions behind you. Um, exactly. But what I would say, if you're trying to jump into the feature market, having a high concept idea really helps too. And so when I, I decided I wanted to try to get back into screenwriting because this film was being made, I there's something I always thought of doing, and I and be open to different genres. But I thought I'd like to take Sense and Sensibility, which is the Jane Austen book, and it's in public domain, so you don't have to purchase the rights to use it. Right. I, I want to take that, those sisters and turn them into modern day assassins. <laughs> because to me, that was a high concept and it was something I thought would be really fun for me to write. And so I outlined the, and I took Emma Thompson's screenplay. I didn't even use the novel and I outlined her screenplay. Right. And then I was like, oh, that's the story. That's the entire plot. How do I, turn this into an action film with three female actors what an interesting way to come at it thanks yeah and I so my husband michael is at gersh and i didn't have an agent and i just said you know would you show it to your agents and he's like um okay sure so he sent it in and his first agent said yeah i don't this isn't really for me but do you want me to show it to some of my colleagues I was kind of disappointed. I was like, oh, it's not for him. Maybe it's not as good as I think it is. And by the way, I'm fortunate. Michael gives me notes on everything and he's incredible. At well, that. You, you, you live with not only a great yes. screenwriter producer, but he's also a very excellent teacher. Yes. So you're living, you're living with a big advantage. I am. I have a huge advantage. And I didn't always take, take you know, I didn't always grab that because usually he would really piss me off. I was really bad at taking notes. And like, I would want him to sleep on the couch after, you know, it was like, I hate you, you son of a bitch. That's called being an immature, uh, an immature, insecure writer. So, that, so that's where I used to be. That's a great moment for me to ask you about note sure. taking. Yes. So you've learned over time to take notes in a positive way, not a negative way. Yeah, it's it's hard because I'm a fiery person. Mm -hmm. and I would get really pissed off. Well, you took it personally. Yes. 
And he was trying to come, I'm sure, coming at you from a uh, a non-personal perspective. He's coming yeah. at you from a this will work and not work perspective. He's a professional. He was treating me like a professional writer. Mm -hmm. But I really wasn't mentally a professional writer. I was an insecure, immature writer mm -hmm. with a big ego. Those are bad combinations. That's big ego, insecure. And there's no one Terrible. else like that in Los Angeles. No. <laughs> Like everybody, yeah. you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still don't always like getting notes from Michael. I think it's hard to get notes from someone, well, but I always take. I do. Well, take tell me someone that likes getting notes. Nobody likes getting notes. The question is, is whether you're able to take the notes yes. in a positive, respectful, constructive manner. If yes. the notes are disrespectful, that's a different story. But if somebody's actually giving you constructive notes. Your job is to sit there and consider them. You don't have to actually act on them, but you've got to consider them if you're smart about it. Yes. And it's very important to look. Sometimes you're going to be upset. Sometimes you're going to be disappointed when you get the notes. You are never going to show that to the person giving you the notes, mm -hmm. even if it's your sister. You know, like you just have to listen. You can stew and rage inside, um, but you write down all the notes. You just. What do, you, what do you find most helpful in the notes? What notes help you? Well, you know, the last process I went to, which was with Lifetime, was, um, uh, okay, how do I say it succinctly? It was a lot of whip, whip sawing, you know, based on, based on just what was top, topical. And whip, whip sawing as in the notes were disagreeing with each other? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, like you'd give a draft based on their notes and then they'd be like, oh, we didn't, yeah, that wasn't really the right way to go. So here's some new notes. And so, so, so there they was a gave you poor, they gave you poor, unhelpful notes, but they, but they, <laughs> you thought it was taking you in a direction you went and it really wasn't helping you. Well, it, and I think, well, here's what happened. COVID happened. And so uh, well, there you go. So, right. So COVID changed the tone that they wanted. And so it wasn't really their fault, um, but I had to be super flexible. And what I would, what I said to myself with every set of notes that felt contradictory from the previous notes, I said to myself, this could be a movie. There might be a day you're on the set of this movie. So you need to function as someone who's going to get a movie made, which means lifetimes funding this, these notes are going to get a movie made. And coming from that perspective made it easier for me to be flexible, to be a team player, because I kept picturing the film being made. And I was lucky that I, that that's what happened. Well, that, um, that, that's a great attitude. Yes. And it, you know what? Attitude is everything. I did not have it my first go around. I was just terrified and, you know, uh, um, it just all the things. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, as you say, I'm a mature writer now and I'm a professional writer now. And that's the difference. And that's a, that's a very big and significant difference. Yeah. Um, uh, so what, what movies and stories do you take inspiration from now? What, I, I, obviously you just said sense and sensibility. What else, what do you look at when you're trying to figure out what's in the world that inspires you? Yeah. Um, well, I have to say my kids, I mean, my kids are teenagers now and um, they are super creative. I'm terrified they're both going to go into this business somehow, but at the same <laughs> time, I think they would make this business a better place. So my daughter Rowan has been reading so many amazing books. And so I've, I come to her now and I just take all her recommendations. I just recently finished reading, um, I'm thinking of ending this. I finished reading A Little Life. I mean, these are just fantastic uh, inspirations for creativity. Um, of course, I love great films. Um, I wanted to write a horror film for a long, long time because I love the fact that paranormal activity costs like $10,000 and it just relied on the audience filling in all the blanks. Sure. You know, just, um, yeah. I mean, there's some terrible work out there, but I recently watched the TV series White Lotus on HBO Max. I don't know what, if what an oddball series. Uh, for me, having been a waitress for so long, mm -hmm. I was, I just was so inspired by it. I thought it took so many bold, made so many bold choices. Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it's just continuing to be part of, to, to continue to ingest uh, creative things like books and 
and I love to go see the theater. I, I love to see, you know, sometimes small theater is the best because it's more experimental. It's they take yeah. chances. They take chances yeah, they that, that uh, the mainstream theaters can't take because they need the audience to come in. And I, and I need to challenge myself. You know, the whole war movie thing, I, I years ago, I got to go to uh, Washington DC and spend a lot of time with uh, journalists that were embedded, you know, in Iraq. I mean, this age is, dates me quite a lot, but um, I, and I actually got to kind of correspond a little bit with Sebastian Younger about his book war. And, mm -hmm. um, I just became fascinated by people that do things that I would be terrified to do. I ended up going to Greece in 2015 to, to go into the refugee camps and volunteer for about 10 days and write some stories for Huffington post. And so I'm always trying to step outside my comfort zone. You know, me, we, as writers have to be careful not to be so insulated from the world with our working constantly that we lose we, we don't have anything to write about. So do, do you find that that fills your well? Yeah, it totally fills my well. Yeah. I mean, I got to meet some of the most extraordinary people in Lesbos, you know, going into those refugee camps. I remember mm -hmm. uh, the Paris attacks happened while I was there and um, I was scared, you know, that night in the hotel, like two boats exploded in the Harbor. And we'd been, we'd been hearing in the news that terrorists were going to target refugee camps and there was a refugee camp there at the harbor and I thought we got to get out of here and then these these like literally the like men that look like Thor come into the hotel wearing yellow slickers and they've just come off the sea where they've pulled like 30 people out of the water and and they're from Sweden so they're gorgeous you know they're like this I mean it was crazy and this one guy had a really long beard and I said wow, you got a great beard. He goes, oh, you should have seen it when I was with the Taliban. I'm like, what are you talking about? They were doctors without borders. Wow. Like they go everywhere, everywhere they're needed. And, and I said to him, aren't you afraid it's dangerous here right now? Aren't you afraid we might die? And he said, oh, I've been stabbed three times, shot once and had cancer. If you decide you're not going to die, you won't die. And I'm thinking, no, you won't die, but I will because I'm wow. a housewife from from you know west la yeah. but anyway you know being around those experiences and people that do this kind of have different lives is so stimulating and exciting you 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 won't find me doing that kind of thing that's just uh, you're yeah. not going to come off the water with your beard you, and your your, you your beautiful are, lush long hair you are not going to find me just dropping down into a war zone to take care of things that's just not who i am and yeah. i'm perfectly happy to let other people take care of those things <laughs> if they if they wish to and yeah. sit back and, and admire them, but that's just yeah. not, not who I am. Let's talk for one moment about pitching. What is your philosophy toward pitching? Yeah, so um, I like to pitch. Um, I think the main thing about pitching is take the, I, I think when you walk in the door, there's a lot of pressure to sell. I mean, everybody wants to sell. And what I found is if I have in my mind I have to sell this because of whatever bill I need to pay. I mean, obviously we have real world world concerns. We want to put gas in our car, food on our table, pay our mortgage, all those things. I think you have to turn off that part of your brain and just say, I want to tell a really interesting story to these people. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to hear this interesting story and, um, and, and, and come into a room with that intention. Um, and also to connect to, remember why you wrote the story, right? What it was that made it feel important to you. And uh, yeah, and to just come in there. And the other thing is to, to want to meet these people. So it's when I walk in a door, I, I was considered a really good pitcher. I did sell some pitches. Like I sold an idea for a TV show that I uh, was based on my childhood. And um, I, I pitched it with Craig Zayden and Neil Marin. Unfortunately, Craig has passed, um, yep. but they were kind of huge producers back in the day. And this huge. was the first um, TV show that they'd ever attached themselves to. And, uh, and we sold it. Unfortunately, it didn't get produced. I don't need to go into that whole story, but um, I, I would go in the room and remember what it was that I loved about it. And really it was, I, my mom was married four times by the time I was 13 and, Holy my, moly. and my dad was the first one. So Holy moly. yeah. So I was a kid who was dropped into a lot of different environments. 
based on all the marriages. So my dad's world was suburban and Mormon. My mom's world, the first one was a LAPD. We moved onto a sailboat in Antioch, California, off of Delta in this shitty harbor uh, next to the prison. My right. Goodness. Like I was around a lot of people doing drugs and I was nine years old. I was a wild, feral child. I broke my two front teeth in a fight with my stepbrother, you know, who's three years older than me, but he came out worse for the wear. Then the next dad was the firefighter that was our next door neighbor in the harbor. And they lived in a van and drank a lot of wine. And then the fourth father was the vice president of a shipping line. And my mother, that was a totally different, you know, he was of, of Italian descent and uh, made me a an Italian by breaking, you know, pottery at my feet and dancing the horror or something. I don't know. So that those worlds. So this TV show was Jupiter and Mars about a kid navigating, you know, these worlds. And I hadn't seen that before. I'd seen divorced parents navigating, but never like an 11 year old girl. And we sold it because the theme of what divorce does to children was extremely important to me. And I walked into the room to meet Mark and to meet Joan and whoever these people were. And the first thing I'd say was, you know, whose parents were divorced? Hands would raise. Mm -hmm. Our generation, there was a lot of divorce. That's when it started really happening. Right? Sure, sure. And, uh, and, I would, and I would start from there, you know? Um, and if no one's parents, if none of them had divorced parents, I'd say, this is what it does to a kid. This is what it, it's like. And by the way, the show was a comedy. So it was not a drama. It was a single camera half hour comedy, but it had the underpinnings of that theme, which was very important to me. Well, what's so when the, you walk what's... in the rooms, you know, these are people you want to meet the people, you want to know who they are, you want to tell them who you are and why you love this idea and how you're connected to it and what the themes are. What what's the old uh, adage about comedy? It's tragedy plus time. Yeah. Yes. So that you have a little perspective. I think that's what that's all Oh, and about. you know, by the way, it was a magical childhood. I mean, I had to go to therapy for 20 years, but there well, were so many great things about well, it. Well, you had all those experiences. Yeah. You weren't just sitting in a, you, you weren't having a, you know, a, a lovely time. You were actually going through all this conflict, which is really storytelling. It is. It's the essence of storytelling. Do you have, if, if I said to you, you had a choice. You could you could blog novel, write novels, write screenplays, write fiction or nonfiction. Do you have something that if if that's your choice for the rest of your career, that was what you would do? Is there one? Oh, probably it would be. I feel most comfortable in the screenwriting format. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get a lot more films made. I mean, having two films made in three years is like I can't believe it. Well, wow, it's amazing. Yeah, it feels like wow. And I thought one would be enough. I thought now I don't have to ever write again. I've got a film made. It went to Sundance. It was well reviewed. It was, you know, but now I'm like, oh God, I suddenly I've become ambitious again. You, you, you wet your whistle, as they say. Like, yeah, I've got this horrible ambition. It's like, damn it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, I have been uh, speaking with the incredible Shannon Bradley Collieri for around an hour at this point. And then uh, we're going to sort of wind this thing down a little bit. I'm just curious in all of your experiences, and you've obviously and clearly had many, um, can you share with us a story that is either weird, quirky, strange, oddball, offbeat, or just plain funny? Uh, well, you know, as a writer, um, it, those are trickier. I could tell you some as an actor. Sure. <laughs> if, if you got them, tell them. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I um, was a bit of a video vixen back in the day and I got to dance for in excess as a suicide blonde at the VMAs. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. So um, that was hilarious. Um, so, so it's very humbling anyway. Um, yeah. You know, I'm in the in excess trailer and there's a knock at the door and they're all doing drugs. And the funny thing is no one offered me any. And I, this is while Michael Hutchins is still alive. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's still okay. alive. Yeah. Got it. Yes. Kylie Minogue was his girlfriend at the time. And she was, you know, we suicide blondes. She was sort of trying to protect him. Like don't come close to Michael. And uh, he wouldn't <laughs> wear shoes. So, you know, people were, you know, as we're walking to the stage, people are little handlers and running in front of him with little brooms, making sure he doesn't step on anything. 
but you know, anyway, there's a knock on the trailer door and, and no one's, everyone's on drugs. And so I'm like the Mormon one who I'm not Mormon anymore, but you know, my, my stepmom scared the crap out of me about drugs. So I never did any, but I opened the door and there's Steven Tyler, right? From Aerosmith. Wow. And he's in a robe and his hair is drenched and he's got a blow dryer. He's like, Hey, sweetie. Um, so, you know, the electricity is out in the Aerosmith trailer. Um, can I use your bathroom to blow dry my hair? And I'm like, it's like, he's a, my girlfriend. I'm like, yeah, come on in. It's right over there. You know, I hear him. He comes out. He looks fantastic. He says, how do I look, sweetie? I'm like, you look great. He goes, God, I love you. And off he goes. But it was like I was talking to a fellow woman. <laughs> oh, you look great. You, it's not too much. It's not too Farah. I'm like, no, 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 it's, it looks fantastic. But anyway, I have a lot of hair and I had to wear a wig. So as I'm dancing to, to, as we're performing, my wig falls off. Oh my goodness. And down in the front row, Slash is pointing and laughing. And so anyway, that's one of my experiences that I can talk about. And there were a lot of, boy, be, you know, the acting experience is very humbling. Yeah, I would think so because it's all about you. It's not, they're judging you. The rejection is just, we just don't like you specifically. That's the real challenge <laughs> as an actor is that yeah. the, they're actually looking at you, your physicality yeah. and your voice and your attitude and who yeah. you are as a human being and yeah. making a judgment on you and they're, oh, yes. they're, and they're rejecting you before they're accepting yeah. you. So that's uh, very, very difficult to do. I, yeah. I, you know, I admire people that can go through that. So that's great. That's great, great fun story. Last question for you today, Shannon. Yes. Um, do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you can lend to those that are maybe just starting out in the business? And you've already given us a ton of really great advice, but <laughs> something beyond uh, that, that uh, might help someone to get into the business or maybe who someone's in a little bit and trying to get to the next level. Right. Which is the first piece of advice that I would offer my younger self is do not overly fetishize one piece of work right? Like if you have that one story from your childhood that you absolutely must see published or produce and you will die upon your sword until it is, you're in trouble, right? So what I've learned in over 23 years of being a professional writer is to just keep writing. It's like Dory, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and you need a dozen baby turtles. So one of them will get to the ocean. Mm -hmm. And then I, what I would also say is relationships are your most important friends you uh you are going to want to reach out and reach out and reach out and reach out so if you're a novelist just keep submitting just keep submitting there's a ton of agents out there there's a ton of people do your research never give up just keep you know so the writing is one exercise the other exercise is building relationships and reaching out and allowing rejections to just put fuel to the fire. Mm. If you start getting notes from somebody about what you've submitted, that's a sign you need to keep going. Uh, the first agent I, I tried to get as a writer um, came to me via the plays that were produced. And um, she said, uh, I can't take you right now. You need to write screenplays. And I, she was not my agent. She never ended up being my agent, but I, started writing screenplays. I got into the UCLA MFA that ended up being a conduit to having my work seen by industry professionals. Do your research. Where are those venues that it's worth investing some of your money to get you to people who actually make films or make television shows? You know, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. My daughter, Rowan, uh, this summer got an internship doing um, screen. She as a um, Oh gosh, you know, the people that will read screenplays for a company and give them coverage. So she, right. she did, she became, got a coverage internship. So if you're a kid who's in college, seek out those internships, mm -hmm. take those people, those companies. If you're an adult, for me, the blacklist ended up being a conduit to producers finding that screenplay. It could be that you could take um, an adult UCLA or whatever college is in your, you know, universe screenwriting course. A lot of times people that teach those courses have connections. Um, so it's really, it's writing number one, be prolific, be prepared for rejection. Rejection is your friend. It teaches you how to, what you need to, what isn't working for you. So you can try something different. Um, yeah. I mean, it just takes a lot of 
you know, putting your ego aside and, 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 and humbling yourself enough to honor your work, right. To, to make the work your, it's, it's, it's the thing that you are taking care of and moving forward. You're just, it's advocate. Well, that was, that's a whole bunch of incredible advice all, yeah. all in one fell swoop that, that's, uh, you know, what you're saying is, is it just takes work, effort, energy, and discipline and sticking to it. That's yeah. really what you're saying in a nutshell. Uh, and there is no substitute. You, as I've said many times on this show, uh, you can't go down to the corner store and buy your career. You actually have to do it. It doesn't matter who you are. You have to put in the work. Yep. Yeah. So that, that's just terrific. Well, Shannon, this has been so much fun for me to hear yeah. your your world and, and how you do it and how you've progressed throughout time, especially to go from a less mature writer to a much more mature writer. I think that that's really fantastic. Thank you. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and, and being with me here today. Thanks so much. Nice to meet you. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.